Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about a TV show we did in Sweden called Hackad or Hacked in English. Uh, it was very popular by regular people and it seemed to inspire a lot of people to become aware of cybersecurity issues. And I hope this presentation can inspire someone here to do something similar in some other part of the world. A few sentences about me. I'm from Sweden. I started my career working for IT, uh, IKEA. IT operations. I was actually here in Singapore in 1999, prepping for the Y2K transition, 19 years old. Uh, later I did, uh, I studied computer science and became a software engineer. Also visited NUS as an exchange student back then. Um, and since 12 years back, I've been focusing 100% on penetration testing. And since 2017, I run my own freelance company doing only penetration testing. Uh, yeah. So this TV series uh, was made by SVT, Swedish television. It's like BBC, it's publicly funded national television. It was six ep episodes where we hack different things. I'm gonna talk about three of these episodes today. And good to know when you listen to this is that we had three days of recording and hacking as a budget for each episode. So we could prep as much as we wanted to on our own time, but we had three days per, per test or per episode, so to speak, and that included recording. And this wouldn't be anything without my hacker friends, the ones in the series, Gene Ramsmark, David Jacobi, and Jesper Larsson. They are awesome hackers, they have a lot of energy, and this uh, would, yeah, would never be the same without them. Big shout out to them. So on to the first episode that we did. We targeted regular individuals, private individuals, and SVT really wanted us to, to try to, we, we wanted to hack as many as possible and get access to their online accounts, email, social media, and SVT really wanted us to be able to track someone in real time such that we could make good TV out of it, like capture them somewhere uh, with a camera. And how, how we went about this was SVT used their Facebook group to, to attract people like they usually do with new TV shows. So they picked out, they, people could like submit their interests in the Facebook group and they picked out 20 people um, that they liked that, and they called it a digital experiment and they were intentionally vague about what it's gonna entail. Um, so they picked out 20 people and had them, invited them to a casting situation where they were supposed to be interviewed on camera and filling, filling out a form to start this digital experiment. And of course, this is where we had all our attacks, attacks prep, prepped. We had Wi-Fi attacks, we had phishing attacks, social engineering, malicious USBs, and leaked passwords. And they set up a, yeah, like a hacking office where we were sitting and where they came at this day. So, because this was COVID times, there were 20 people, they came in groups of five. But actually, every group of five had, the fifth guy was one of us. So that was Jesper, one of the hackers. That's where the social engineering part came in. So the camera, the most, almost all the screen images here is from the, from the TV show. So this is uh, one of the groups. And the pretext for, for our attacks was that they were supposed to fill out a form. So we created an online portal called something like Digital Experiment, where they had to sign in, create an account, sign in, and fill out a form. And it looks something like this. And obviously, whatever you did here, you gave us your passwords. So we had Facebook, Google, and LinkedIn, single sign-on pages and they can create their own account. So we got a bunch of passwords that way. Another way was when they actually created the account, an error message turned up. This is where the social engineering came in. So this is Frida, one of the participants. She was unaware of this, of course. So she's showing an error message to Jesper, one of my friends. And he's like, yeah, I had that error as well. And here's a USB stick with the solution. So we prepped the USB stick with PDFs files for Windows and for Mac with backdoors. 
so off to getting their passwords via the phishing, then we try to uh, execute backdoors on their machines using uh, malware PDF files. How many do you think we got of the 20? All of them, we got usernames and passwords for all of them, sometimes many of them or several of them. We also used leaked databases, searched for them for their email addresses in leaked databases, databases of course. Backdoors, unfortunately, I built the backdoor for PC, uh, and that's the black uh, faces there, that it, it failed to execute properly. Uh, but the Mac backdoor uh, worked very well. So we had seven backdoors on the people who brought uh, Macs. And after this day, these 20 people coming there, we gathering all this information, we picked out two people that worked well with TV and also worked well with the stuff we collected on them. Frida was one of them. So we had access to her computer. We had access to some passwords. So we, uh, and because we wanted to track someone live, we enabled Google location services on our Google account. So we could see that she was in Gothenburg, which is three hours from the city where we were working. And we saw that when she was there in the, in the casting, she chatted up a guy where they, she was interested in some guy that he, they talked to each other. And we could see that she'd been Googling him and looking him up on LinkedIn. Uh, that was, yeah. Interesting, and then we can see that she was in Gothenburg, and when we went through her email, yeah, they consented to this, but I don't think they read the fine print, but uh, yeah, we read her email, uh, and we can see that she had train tickets arriving in Malmö, the city where we were working or sitting, 20 minutes after we, we saw the tickets. So perfect opportunity to, to do what the TV company wanted us to do. So we went to the train platform, caught her getting off the train. This is Jesper, who acted as a mole during this casting situation. So they actually knew each other, but she didn't know that he was a hacker. So we caught her on the platform, brought her up outside, and like disclosed to her what we've been doing. And she was, of course, surprised. And we pay, we, we were clear to them before, or pretty clear that they should bring their own laptop, their private laptop because we didn't want to end up in a situation where we hacked like some corporate laptop. Uh, what do you think this facial expression indicates? <laughs> she did not bring her own laptop. She bought her friend's laptop. That's why when we got the back door on her computer, we were looking around her files, the profile said Emma, and there was no Emma there. So uh, Emma is Frida's friend. Uh, okay, so that was, the first person. The other person was Andreas. Uh, he was invited back to the office a day later for us to tell him what we, what we got on, on him. So we didn't get a backdoor on his computer. We didn't manage to log into his primary email address because he had two-factor authentication turned on. It was a Gmail address. But looking at online leaks, we could find the password for the matched that worked for one of his old email, email addresses, a live email address. Using the live email address, we could, we could see that this was tied to a bunch of his accounts. So we could do password reset for, on his Facebook account, for instance, locking him out of Facebook. We did that pretty close to when he came to visit us. And then we created this graph to show him the access we had. So he used Facebook to authenticate to a bunch of different apps. He used his live account to use Microsoft 365 for the family, like managing this kid's screen time, money, etc. And we showed him, showed this to him um, as part of, as the end of episode one. And stepping up a bit from private people, we had one episode where we were gonna hack celebrities. So SVT found two celebrities. The guy on the left is a Swedish comedian He's a TV host of a, a news, uh, like satirical news program on SVT, freelance consultant. Therese Lindgren on the right side there is an influencer, unknown to me, but I was informed that she's very famous uh, by my daughter and her friends. Um, 
So we had, of course, the vision we had was that we're gonna post videos of ourselves on their social media platforms. That was our goal. So we started with Therese Lingen. And we spent four days in Stockholm to do this. And that's a trip, five hour trip from where we are normally staying. Um, so, and NCT, they had an idea that I should, they had an interview with her the first day, like talking about her computer habits, etc. They had an idea that I should bump into her on the street after that interview, like spontaneously, without disclosing who I was, for, because of good TV reasons. So this is the selfie that I took when I bumped into her. And then we thought, because we were gonna do a bunch of attacks against her, social engineering attacks, phishing attacks, so we thought maybe we could use this as a pretext to a phishing attack, to kind of tie it into reality somehow. So Ginny, one of my friends, she created an, like, she created an offensive comment on one of her videos, and then she created an email account pret pretending to be my daughter, who got the selfie, because I said the selfie is for my, for my daughter. And he, she, he, she emailed Therese, referencing the comment and referencing the selfie to connect it to reality, to like a physical meeting to be more successful. And of course, if she clicked the comments, she got to a YouTube login page where we wanted to fish our password, but that failed. Um, she parked her car illegally at this meeting with SVT. We took a picture of it just for, for fun, but we realized later, and we, we are doing all of this during the three days we spent on her, working on her in Stockholm in the hotel room. So we quickly threw up, a, put up a fishing site for a, or a parking company site that was fake. And we sent her an SMS saying she's parked illegally and she needs to pay a fine. And the fine event, the, the flow eventually led to signing with Facebook or Google. She did not do that. She clicked it. She told us later that she stopped at the login prompt. So I'm not sure if she was like extra alert during this time because she knew we we're gonna track, trying to hack her. But that failed. So we went to her house using <laughs> spy glasses because the TV guy or the camera guy was, uh, he couldn't uh, follow us. David there is holding my antenna and we're trying to find any SSID, any Wi-Fi that's connected to or has the name of her or her boyfriend. But we couldn't find that, so that failed. We used the Mac backdoor from the first episode and put that on a USB stick, put it in the envelope and write the paper that she's been nominated for an award, uh, best YouTube influencer or something, bullshit. And then uh, we put that in, her, or in the mailbox down next to her door. That failed. So everything failed and we learned that this is a good TV because you need drama, you need up and down. But we, we thought this sucked, of course. One guy that didn't fail though, was a burglar that later smashed the window of her car, grabbed her MacBook, and she's quoted here in the, in the newspaper, uh, I'm disgusted because I didn't have a uh, password for my computer. So this is quite horrible. Um, I hope she recovers from that. Okay, more success with the old man. Uh, this guy is a comedian and he's making fun of people on TV. And in this clip, he's making fun of a CEO of a Swedish, large Swedish security company that was hacked a couple of years back. And the CEO said, they hacked us despite us having double passwords. That's what he said. It was hilarious and he made fun of him. And it, we thought it's even more hilarious if we can make fun of him. Uh, so that was our goal. And because we spent three days in Stockholm working on Therese, failing, we had one day on Christopher. Uh, and his name is Christopher Appelqvist. So before we went to Stockholm, we of course looked through all our database dumps that we had downloaded, and we, we found that he had used two passwords, Katamaran, as you can see here, and another one, Hata SJ. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Swedish? Yeah. <laughs> Hata SJ means hate SJ, and SJ is the public train company. <laughs> we thought that was funny as well. That's, uh, yeah. So, but they failed. Or we couldn't use these for any, anything. Uh, except creating a meeting called Hata SJ with him. 
But this was the day we worked on him. You could, this is from my calendar. Nine in the morning, we, or SVT had like an interview thingy with him. And then they told us, so 19.30 in the evening, uh, you're gonna, we're gonna meet him again, and you're gonna tell him how you hacked him. So we had 10 hours. And we, we thought that if we're gonna succeed with this, we, we need physical access to his computer. Uh, so we said, we said we, uh, Jesper, who was a mole in episode one, we said, yeah, he has to be a mole in, in this attack as well for us to succeed. Otherwise, we have two celebrities uh, which we couldn't hack. That would be pretty bad. <laughs> so he showed up posing as a cameraman or a sound technician during this morning interview. And while they were interviewing him, he plugged it in and installed the backdoor on his laptop. Um, while he did that, me and David were sitting outside in the car having control over the command and control server and made sure that we got the connection working. And when we did, we, of course, we downloaded everything we could. And what do you download if you can download anything? Any suggestions, no? Uh, this is pretty neat. Uh, stored passwords databases of various browsers. Pretty quick to download small files. In his case, we saw that the Chrome database stored around 200 uh, passwords. And you can see the host name, you can see the login name, but you can't see the password, of course, because that's encrypted with a key, and the key is stored in the keychain on a MacBook. And the keychain is, of course, also a file you can download, and it's protected by the password you use to log into your MacBook. So it all became, during this day, become, became all about cracking the password to his keychain so we can open the Chrome database, because there there were all his online accounts and even like corporate accounts as well. So offline cracking passwords was what we did all day. And what I do when I do that, I use word lists. Many of you have, have probably done this. I use public word lists, I use my own. I add words for this particular victim to it. I use word list rules. And then eventually brute force patterns like this. But because this is um, the Apple keychain, it's pretty hard. It's pretty slow to crack, guessing passwords. Here are some speeds for the graphics card I use. So Apple keychain, two million per second, which is far less than, than like NT hashes, for instance. But we did this for hours in the hotel room, our lists, his passwords, and of course rules and stuff to that, but we didn't get anywhere. So I was like, I was, while this was going on, I was thinking, how can he have picked his passwords? And of course, every, everyone has, or a lot of people have their favorite words, and then they have additions to that. So I thought, yeah, we'll, we'll get all, I can get all the date of births and all secure, social security number stuff from the Swedish tax authority, which I did. So I called the Swedish tax authority because this is public information in Sweden. She was a little bit hesitant. Like, Do you really need the full social security number, like the last four digits? And I was, yeah, and I want it for the kids, for the wife, for everyone at that address. And I put that into the list and I put it in the end of his, fam his uh, favorite words and cracked the password. <laughs> so this was his password for Apple Keychain. Unlock the Keychain, unlock the Chrome saved passwords database, 200 pa passwords in plain text. And then um, it was time for the meeting in the evening. So 19.30, Jesper went back told him, or they, they told him that who, she, who, who he really was. And he said something like, uh, have you checked the Instagram lately? And he was like, no, 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 you haven't touched my Instagram. <laughs> yes, we did, yes, we did. I, this, I did it on my phone, I logged in on my phone for some reason, I took this picture and Jeannie there on the TV, she's working remotely from, from Malmö, and this is in the hotel room, and the sign says double passwords in Sweden. And the text says something like, yeah, we, from Christopher to, to his followers, that he, we, have hacked, we have hacked his account, and to protect it, we recommend double or even triple passwords. <laughs> and he said, this is tough because, yeah, well, uh, this screen here to the left, when we had this Teams meeting, we, we still had the back door in his computer, so me and David were sitting in the hotel room, and while we were talking to him, we popped up the PDF with the plain text passwords such that he could see it on his own computer. 
And he was like, ah, oh, this is stuff because these are not only my passwords. It was like FTP uh, servers and stuff for projects he, were, he was working with. And this is his face when he says, uh, proof that I'm owned. Okay, so and because, I mean, we, we target hi, targeted him basically as a private person and then we got corporate stuff as well, which is not unreasonable. So let's say we got VPN access, we could have used that to get into a corporation. We didn't, we stopped at that point, but let's kind of transition into the episode we did on hacking companies. Um, can you hack a city is the name of this episode and that's because Helsingborg's Hem, the company there with the logo, it's the public housing company of one of Sweden, Sweden's largest cities. So they have 12,000 apartments that they rent to, to citizens and there are higher demands than there are supplies. So there's a queuing system which people, where people queue in, in, in years to get an apartment. So together with them, we decided that we're gonna target two of their systems, the database of residents uh, which is sensitive because they have politically exposed people, they have protected housing for, for uh, groups of women that are, have been abused, etc. And also the house queuing system. So if you could manipulate the queuing system, then you can place yourself on top, in top, on top of the queue. So we decided together with them to do this via social engineering and regular network hacking. This is the CIO, and uh, they are very brave to, uh, to participate in this, I think. So they should have all the cred. But it was interesting in the, the pre-interview, he said, I think the social engineering is gonna succeed, but I don't think the network uh, attack is gonna succeed. Okay, so our plan, uh, Raspberry Pi, we use this quite often. We have prepped the Raspberry Pi, connected to the network, it will create a VPN out such that we can VPN back in, WireGuard or NSSH for, um, to have two channels. And before we did some reconnaissance of their office premises, and they had built a new office pretty recently. They had these doors that open and close pretty quickly. This was COVID time, so there were very few people coming and going, and we realized that we, we will not be able to tailgate in here. We need some, some reason to be there. So we used a technique that we've used before, um, inviting ourselves in. So, I bought a domain with, instead of the L, the I, so the email address here, it's just typed in the browser, but it's an uppercase L instead of an I. So depending on the mail client, will you see the difference or not? Uh, but we created a new domain with a similar name, and we used the font and the CIO's signature exactly as he's using it, and then we emailed the reception, basically saying there's a consultant coming, can you give him a conference room to work in before I come in. He's gonna work on some sensitive uh, investigation or something we wrote. So David, one of my colleagues, he, he looks good, he's very confident, so he, he looked the part, he had uh, like a shoulder bag with a hidden camera. So this is from the hidden camera. He walks up to the receptionist and she said, yeah, I got the email, but I need to call Richard up to, to verify that you that I can let you in, which is, was not part of that process we learned later, but she did that anyway. Of course, we anticipated this, so we had a person on the outside call Richard to make the phone line busy and try to keep it busy as long as possible. But she, she called him up and called him up, and eventually she reached Richard and he said, this is, uh, he's not invited. So, access denied, owned by the receptionist. Uh, <laughs> So we were pretty bummed out and we went to take, a, take lunch and then the camera guy said, but they have an old office, we could go there. So that's what we did. Went to the old office, looked through the windows, tried to find a door that was open. There were no people inside, we couldn't find a door that was open. And this was March in Sweden, so pretty cold. So we sat back in the car, tried to see if we could do something to the Wi-Fi. And while doing that, we, we noticed a guy opening a door that we hadn't seen before. So there, there were people coming and going and there was a door used for that. So I, I took the shoulder bag with a, with a hidden camera and a Raspberry Pi and stood by the door. And this is a bad picture, but this is, you can see the door barely or almost closing there. I grabbed the handle 
and I did a classic tailgating to get in. Walked in and the office was very empty, but I could hear some voices. So it turned out that the, the door there on the left is a meeting room where some pe people were sitting. But other than that, the office was empty. I walked around, found a, found a place to connect the Raspberry Pi, waited for the lights to blink so we know we have a connection with the switch. This is actually the only fake thing in the TV series because when I connected it, the hidden camera was pointing the wrong direction. So this is uh, under my desk at home. But it looked, it looked exactly the same. And this, yeah, so where do you go when, you've, when you're in this situation? Where do you go? Huh? I, you want to go to a safe place, you want to breathe, and you want to make sure that you have connection back out to the server. So you, ru you run, or you walk to the toilet, close the door, and this is the, this is the picture from the toilet, but this is actually also the news article that was the top news article the day we released the TV show. I, I woke up the morning, uh, looked at my phone, and this was the, this is my face in the toilet. Uh, <laughs> so that was, yeah, a little bit funny. So I was in the toilet. I called my hacker friends on the outside. Jesper was driving a car. He stopped the car, SSH'd into the server, made sure that we had contact with the Raspberry Pi, and we did. The time was 15.39 this day, that it says in the chat there. That's interesting, because later. We drive back to Malmö, it's a 50, 60 minute drive, back to this office that you saw a picture of before. Buy some Fedora burgers, COVID times. Uh, restaurants closed at 1900s, I think. And of course, then you have four uh, crazy hackers that want to go nuts and uh, own, the, own everything as soon as possible. So we go, at, we go chaotically at different uh, directions on the network. Um, and I like Active Directory, so I, I, I run my Windows, or I, I like Windows and Active Directory, so I start the Windows attacks. Responder, you probably know about, collecting hashes for uh, SMB authentication on the network. Got, got a few of those pretty quickly, put them into the password uh, cracker, cracked one of them quickly, then we have a low privileged account, so we can talk to Active Directory. So that's step one, usually. What do you do then? Curb roast, one of the best attacks on Active Directory. Turned out they had a service account with a hash that we cracked in 30 minutes, I believe. The password, by, uh, by the way, is uh, placed in the TV series as an Easter egg. Uh, so we cracked this, and yeah, these are the screens we're basically telling we know it's going to be the correct one, but I'm going to try it to the domain controller, and if the tool shows me that the domain controller is owned, that means we're domain admin, which it was. <laughs> 1840, we're domain admin. So 1539, we plugged in the Raspberry Pi, drove one hour, and 1840, we were domain admins. Of course, because of good TV and fun, we dump all the hashes from the Active Directory and try to crack as many as possible. And then we print them on a piece of paper because of also good TV, and we give them to the CIO as like the finale of this episode. So this is Richard to the right there, looking through the plain text passwords, and in, in the bottom it says domain admins, and then there were like five, something like that. And we also showed him our access to the residence database and our ability to change the points in the queuing system. We were considering changing the points to 1,337, but uh, we didn't. <laughs> okay, we're reaching the end here. What's the common thread about the, among all of these attacks? It's passwords, right? Everything I've talked about here basically is bad passwords, stolen passwords, leaked passwords, weak passwords. And I think, I mean, it's 2023. Should we be here? I think it's pretty sad, actually. Um, and I want to pick on some of, some of the big companies that I, I can't, yeah, bad examples, I think. Google, for instance, if you change your password in Google for your Google account, Soma 2023, that's a Swedish word for summer. That would be the most common word, I think, this year, or common password. Google says that's a strong password. You can see that. And if you put in the English word summer 2023, it's a good password. Not a strong, but a good. Microsoft won't allow me to use Swedish characters in my password. 
that makes no sense. If you log into OneNote.com, I mean, we, we are telling the users, this is my point, we're telling the users how they're gonna log into our systems that we build in the IT industry. And we are telling them you shouldn't click on phishing links, you shouldn't enter your password into sites where the URL is fishy or strange looking. So it makes sense that the URL looks like this. You go to OneNote.com, you wanna log in with your Microsoft account, the URL says OneNote.com. If you do this with SharePoint, the URL says login.live.com. And if you do it with office.com, the login or the URL says login.microsoftonline.com. I think this blows my mind and how can we, how can we expect users to know where to put their passwords if we design it like this? We as an industry. We can't blame the users, we have to stop doing that. And there are fortunately a lot of nice passwordless authentication mechanisms co coming along. To the left there are Apple pass keys. They are being rolled out. Windows Hello exists and works, but it needs to be supported, of course, by the, by the application. And to the, on the right side there is a Swedish national bank ID, which is a passwordless uh, out-of-bound mobile authentication mechanism that works very well. And I bet a lot of other countries have similar things. So a few takeaways, I think, I think this is very important. I think we need to stop blaming the users. We've, we've been doing that for a while now. We've been laughing at people's passwords, blaming them for clicking phishing links, etc. And at the same time, we can see domain admin passwords that are set by IT administrators that also suck. And then the IT people blame the regular users for picking bad passwords. So I think we need to be part of the solution. We need to push for better security, better authentication, and where we are doing requirements, we need to require strong authentication, and where we are building, we need to build strong authentication into the systems. And finally, I think we need to inspire people to care about cybersecurity, and I hope we did this with this TV series. That's the feedback we got, and I hope some of you can do the same in some, some way or another in your organization or your country. Thank you very much. Time for questions, if someone has any. I think you need to step up to the mic. Um, my question is, did you find any tokens for applications? Tokens? Yeah. Not that we used, no. But of course, we took all these Chrome files, so we we could have decrypted all the cookies as well. If that were what you meant. Yeah. No one else? Yeah, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be here. If you want to contact me, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, the Twitter is not there, but there's only one person with that name in the world, so you can Google me. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or something you want to talk about. Thank you very much.